Hello and welcome back to Sunboy Online. Now, today we've got some more Wallace and Gromit Vengeance Most Foul news. Specifically, there's been an event with directors Nick Park and Merlin Crossingham going behind the scenes of the film. So this particular interview is with Deadline, who incidentally were the first news site to leak the title of the film. <laughs> anyway, this took place at Deadline's Contenders event in London, held on Saturday the 12th of October, but we didn't really know about it until it had already happened. Firstly, the presenter remarks that it's been almost 20 years since Wallace and Gromit, The Curse of the Were-Rabbit released, which is something to think about. Then we're introduced to directors Nick Park and Merlin Crossingham and executive producer Carla Shelley. And along with them comes Wallace, Gromit, Feathers McGraw and Norbot, the smart gnome. So we found out that the film wrapped post just the day before this interview took place. So that means that all of the filming has been finished for a while. Nick Park comments here that the idea of an evil gnome went back as far as 2005 with The Curse of the Were-Rabbit. And I do wonder if that's tied in with the red flashing eyes and the design of the gnomes in that film. As often, ideas begin as a small doodle in a sketchbook. And uh, originally, I was just playing around with the idea of what if Wallace invented a smart gnome? And what if then things went wrong? And apparently, the moment that the movie kind of clicked for everyone and, and knew the direction of it very clearly was when the idea of Feathers returning popped up. And that's because previously, it was purely about, you know, this evil smart gnome. But with a character like Feathers, you've got that kind of narrative history, the fact fact that he's marinated in jail for like 30 years thinking of nothing but revenge, it's the perfect opportunity. Merlin comments here that they've actually been making the film since 2020. So we, we've been making it since about 2020, so in pre-production and 15 months of filming yeah. and uh, yeah just finished post. Which is ironic because this channel was started in 2020 but um, at the time we had no idea that there was going to be a new Wallace and Gromit film. The videos that I did from that time period were purely retrospective so it's crazy that it's kind of resurged at the same time. There was 15 months of filming in total and it hadn't been seen completed with an audience at the time but has since had its premiere at the Chinese theatre in Hollywood. Believe it or not, a fan actually created a petition for me to go to the premiere. And if you hadn't already noticed, it didn't end up happening. But I just find that amazing, so thank you for that kind thought. So Nick mentions here that Wallace, as always, is well-meaning in the film, but the use of his inventions come at the cost of his relationship with Gromit, which, as it happens, is now reflective of the time we live in. Obviously, Wallace is not a bad guy, but it's all about we're in love with tech and sometimes it gets in the way of relationships. It's kind of a metaphor for, you know, when kids are distracted by tablets and phones and rather than talking to actual people and the family that rather stare at screens. By pure coincidence, Wallace and Gromit was already doing this, showing how Wallace's inventions would cause a load of trouble, Gromit would be dissatisfied with them, and yet rather than changing the film to reflect life, I think real life has actually changed to reflect the world of Wallace and Gromit. They talk a bit about how they went about bringing Feathers McGraw back, because, you know, he's such an iconic villain, he kind of just evoked this, this fear, despite being so simple as a character design. He was animated by Steve Box at the time. Now there are many animators, all trying to imitate that style. So both Merlin and Nick mention here that they tried to calm the animators down in a way, because animators by default want to animate things, whereas Feathers just has to be kind of more reserved and calm and not move as much because that's kind of his thing. We worked really hard with our animators to just just calm him down and make, kind of make him mean in a kind of very gentle but quite sinister way. Which goes against the instincts as animators because you think animators want to move things. <laughs> it's about creating a lot with a little is, is the secret. They mention that villains who don't run are always the scariest because they know that they're going to get you anywhere, they don't need a run. And there's something sinister about that, like an internal stillness. Nick mentions here that the relationship between Wallace and Gromit, as mentioned earlier, will kind of be expanded upon from Curse of the Were-Rabbit, specifically. Which is really cool again, because favourite of the films. I love what they did in that, with it being feature length, because in Were-Rabbit, Gromit has the character development as he learns to live 
with Wallace. We kind of keep exploring that theme in this one because that's always the challenge for Gromit, is how do you live with a guy like Wallace? We kind of play on that more. There's a bit of give and take more in this. So we might get to see the characters in situations that we wouldn't usually. And Merlin mentions here that the film has to have a familiarity for fans, but at the same time be accessible for brand new viewers, which usually when you hear accessible for new viewers, that's when film companies change things too much, which can happen. But the fact that he mentions the fans as well, first and foremost, is uh, confidence inducing. Along with what we saw in the trailer, it's all looking very authentic and um, true to what Wallace and Gromit are. But at the same time, it's been 16 years since the last film, A Matter of Love and Death. So obviously, the film is going to have to be somewhat accessible to people who've never seen a Wallace and Gromit film. Another thing Merlin mentions is the word contemporary. And as a rule, I kind of hate that word being used in fictional media because more often than not, the filmmaker tries to adapt a pre-existing kind of world, film universe, whatever, to fit themes of the modern day. Whereas here, Merlin mentions that it can reflect modern themes, such as the technology that people are addicted to. But at the same time, they're not going to be whipping out smartphones and stuff. It's not contemporary technology it's from a time back along so questions about would they actually have computers in their house if they're from sort of a time gone by it's sort of all about rivets and steel and sort of more of a steampunk kind of vibe which is great because i always find in especially in films like wallace and gromit when they're so kind of self-contained if a character then whips out a smartphone it kind of just disengages you from it they mention that it's back to a feature film, which is something I've always wanted, and that with that, they can tell a proper big adventure with an emotional story. Apparently, there'll be surprises, and quote, it will make everyone cry. Which, I mean, so far, what comes to mind in the franchise is like Gromit in the Kennel, In the Wrong Trousers, and then the end of Where Rabbit, where Wallace dies. So yeah, I think quiet, kind of impactful moments like that are often the highlights uh, that I look forward to now in these films. In terms of voice acting, they mention that this is the first time without Peter Salas, but that the performance of Ben Whitehead is incredibly seamless and just kind of works, which I agree that it does. They go into a bit of detail about getting Peter Kay back on board, which is incredibly cool. Apparently, he was just starting his tour when he was approached for this role, so they kind of didn't expect that he'd be able to do it. But they said that Kay was incredibly keen to return and did an amazing job with reprising the role of the character. Something really interesting that they mentioned here, which is something that I'd mentioned in a previous video, is that he's now grey around the edges and is probably the only Wallace and Gromit character to have aged. Which is something I emphasised before, that we don't know how the passage of time works in Wallace and Gromit. But obviously in this film, we've got Peter Kay as Macintosh, and you'll also have like the town folk from Where Rabbit as well. So the fact that PC Macintosh, I'm imagining has a grey moustache, um, proves that time does indeed pass in Wallace and Gromit's world. Merlin emphasises here that the heart and soul of filming Wallace and Gromit hasn't really changed at all. The technique is exactly the same as it always was. Uh, you know, move it, take a frame, move it, take a frame. So the, the sort of the hands-on craft stop motion of it is still the heart and soul. They try to shoot as much as possible in front of the camera, which is great. Really emphasising that the CG that is used needs to fit perfectly with the film's aesthetic. With this film, we really tried to shoot as much as possible in front of the camera. And it was only then, if we couldn't do that, that we looked at alternatives that were appropriate to tell in the story. And finally, they add that silicone is now used, and this actually helps to speed up production a bit because the silicone is more firm and you still have the fingerprints and stuff like that. But it's a lot easier for the animators because you don't have to go like fixing the clay and making sure it's all the right shape. I can move Wallace and I don't have to re-sculpt his arm. And that might seem like a really simple thing, but it's the difference between an animator finishing half a second of animation a day or one and a half seconds of animation a day. And he emphasises that you need that handcrafted human touch, which is exactly why I think most people love Aardman. At a time when I think like every other studio is using CGI, it just gets a bit dull. 
It's very hard to find other art styles now. They do exist, but they're always quite niche. So to have a kind of mainstream claymation film is of course really cool, but it kind of keeps the medium alive as well. And finally, if you wish to be traumatized, to demonstrate the interchangeable mouths and heads that the characters have, Merlin takes joy in beheading Wallace in front of a live audience, much to their amusement. <laughs> we can take off the head. So yeah, that is every scrap of information that I could dig out of Nick Park and Merlin Crossingham's appearance at Deadline's Contenders event in London. There was also a behind the scenes video shown here, but I'll be breaking that one down in its own video because there's so much to unpack. But if there is a particular detail or something you noticed that I perhaps didn't spot, please let us know in the comments down below. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.